Javier Becerra, Chairman of the Democratic Caucus, uh, joined by our Vice Chairman, Joe Crowley, and today also joined by someone who's worked quite some time on issues that affect jobs, uh, economy, and certainly the impact those two very important issues have on women in America, and that's Donna Edwards from Maryland. Pleased to have her with us. Uh, we had a session where we recapped what our members in the Democratic Caucus have done over the past week while we had a chance to be back in our districts to work without any votes here in Washington, D.C. And I'm proud to say, pleased to say, that our members held over a thousand events throughout the nation in their districts, principally on the issues of jobs, economic growth, and getting this country back on track. And so our members are focused. We're hoping to be able to tell the American people that Congress will work to pass a bipartisan and balanced budget and also continue the effort to try to get America back to work. Uh, it was great to see that over 165,000 jobs were created last month, but we want to continue to see more progress. At the same time, we understand that Republicans used a lot of their time last week to prepare to, for the 37th time, vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act, the rights and protections that Americans now have as a result of the historic health care legislation that passed in 2010. And so we'll put up our 1,000 events and activities that members held throughout the country to work on creating more jobs for America against an effort once again for the 37th time by Republicans in the House to repeal the rights and protections that Americans now have to have quality, affordable health insurance for them and their family. We also know that uh, this week, rather than take up the issue of a balanced budget that could get a balanced vote from Republicans and Democrats in the House and the Senate, uh, that House Republicans are again refusing to name the conferees that would meet with the Senate to reconcile the differences between the House passed budget and the Senate passed budget. Instead of dealing with something as important as the budget, we understand that this week Republicans in the House have proposed putting a bill that I will call the Pay China First Act on the floor. That's a bill that would essentially move us closer toward, for the first time in our history, defaulting on our obligations. It is a way of prioritizing what debts our government will pay to the people that it owes. And the scary thing about that, of course, is that the folks that get paid first under the Republican legislation would be foreign countries uh, at the expense of our veterans. It would be banks at the expense of seniors. And when you ask veterans and seniors and children who would lose out under this Pay China First Act why they are being punished and why they should lose out on services and benefits that they earned, uh, I think most of them would say they have no idea that this is going on in Washington, D.C. The other bill that's going on is a bill that I would call the Work More, Get Paid Less Act because it would, for the first time in decades, tell Americans who work more than 40 hours, you no longer will be entitled to your overtime pay. And while it's disguised as a flexibility act to give uh, workers and their bosses flexibility and determine whether they should get paid overtime or take comp time, extra, free, uh, extra time off, uh, the reality is the only folks who have the flexibility are the employers. And so hardworking Americans who would like to make sure that they have received their time and a half for working overtime will find themselves at a loss. And so we're ready to work. We're ready to get America back to work. But we need a partner here in the House of Representatives. And we hope our Republican colleagues will decide to move far quicker in appointing conferees for the budget, which we know must move, and to actually put legislation that helps Americans who are working rather than takes away their overtime pay. And with that, let me turn it over to our Vice Chairman, Joe Crowley. Thank you, Chairman Becerra. Um, firstly, on uh, the week back in our districts, it gave us all an opportunity take the pulse of our constituency. And what I would say right off the bat is uh, no one in my district asked me to come here to vote for a bill or to introduce a bill or to contemplate a bill that would take away overtime pay uh, for more comp time. Not a single constituent has asked me to do that. Uh, nor has a single constituent asked me to, uh, in, in reference to the first bill that the, the chairman mentioned, uh, the Pay China First Act, asked us to uh, uh, to 
uh, put in order the payments in which we would uh, pay our debt. The fact that we're even having the discussion on a bill about not paying our debts is unhealthy for our country. It's a dangerous bill that the Republicans are putting on the floor today because it intimates that there's a possibility that we may not pay our debts. And the reality is we all know that the United States pays its bills. But in this bill, it would actually put foreign banks and foreign governments and foreign regimes, including China, ahead of our seniors, our veterans, and our brave men and, men and women who are serving, protecting our country overseas. Uh, the front page of the New York Times today once again speaks of how the Chinese military is attacking America's uh, cyber space. And uh, we're under attack constantly. Uh, this bill would actually say, uh, if, we, if we, we, we can't raise the debt ceiling, let's pay China first. Let's make sure they have their resources and yet at the same time not take care of uh, American um, men, women, and children, especially those who are fighting to defend our country overseas and our veterans. Uh, and with that, I'd like to give an opportunity to our uh, great member from the great state of Maryland, Donna Edwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman. I have to tell you, it's hard to know where to begin uh, to begin here. Uh, I'm so surprised that what Republicans want to do is bring back a recycled, redressed, dressed up uh, bill that takes away pay, real pay, uh, from working families. Now, it, it, the act has been described in a number of ways, and I think each of us try to figure out um, how it is that we want to describe something that is so insulting to America's working families, and I describe it as the Working Families to Death Act. And the reason is because what it says is that um, workers will work overtime, over the 40-hour work week, lose their time and a half pay, and in exchange at the behest of the employer, whenever the employer feels like it, be able to take uh, compensatory comp time off. Um, if you think about median workers who are working for hourly wages, they hardly are in a position um, to work only at the behest of the employer and not have any flexibility actually in their work schedule or determining when they would take off and lose pay to boot. It's such a boon uh, for employers. Now, when Republicans first brought this bill up in 1997 and then again in 2003, it was rejected. It was rejected with good reason. Now, they want to say that this is uh, redressed and that problems have been fixed, and it's just not the truth. Uh, the fact is that employees who work for hourly wages would lose their time and a half overtime. We've had uh, a 40-hour work week for 75 years under the Fair Labor Standards Act, and Republicans want to take away that 40-hour work week um, and instead um, make sure that workers are only allowed to receive um, their standard pay but without time and a half for that overtime. Imagine, if you will, if you're an employee who works for minimum wage, and at the end of the week, your employer also wants you to work an additional five hours. Well, instead of receiving time and a half for that pay, the employer would say, you know what, we're going to give it to you in comp time. And not only that, but we're going to, I'll decide when it is that you can take it. Now, if you need to take off or, um, because you're sick or because you need to go to a parent-teacher meeting or for any other reason, you can't take that when you want it, even though you've earned it. Um, and so we can't let the Republicans get away with this for working families. Wages have been stagnant in this country, um, now going on generations. And so while um, the highest income earners are making money hand over fist, our lower income earners, our hourly wage workers, wor wages have been stagnant, and now the GOP wants to rip, to strip away the protections that they get um, from overtime pay. And I know that in my district, when I talk to people in my district who work for hourly wages, many of them actually work two jobs uh, for those hourly wages, and they work at, at minimum wage. And now their employer would be able to tell them 
that you can't get the overtime. Well, that overtime is childcare, that overtime is groceries, that overtime is uh, gas and transportation. Uh, that overtime is meaningful to them. It's a mortgage or a rent payment or the difference between having a home and not. And so these are real wages uh, for working families and it's simply not fair to say we will work you and work you and work you, but we're not gonna pay for it. And we can't allow our uh, employers to get away with what amounts to um, you know, a, a freebie for them. They get the work that they need, they can exchange work out for that comp time, but at the same time, workers are prevented from earning a living to uh, take care of themselves and their families. And so at a time when wages again are stagnant and we should be talking about equal pay and we should be talking about paid leave and earned sick leave, instead we're talking about take, giving comp time and taking away real hourly wages. Uh, we're going to put a fight up against this yet again to say that we stand with the American people, we stand with working families, and we're not going to allow the GOP to dress up a, a bill and call it a flexibility act when the only flexibility there is is flexibility for workers to be abused by their employers. Thank you. Donna, thank you very much for that. And um, I think it's fair to say that we've come back ready to work, ready to fight for the American people. and. We hope that the American people understand that there are things that this Congress could do that are big, that are important, but trying to take away workers' overtime pay is not one of them, and we will fight that as hard as we can. With that, we'll take any questions. Well, I'm going to ask you something in foreign policy. <laughs> We can all respond to that, and what I would tell you is that we have been briefed on a number of occasions on some of these issues, classified briefings. Uh, obviously, we are uh, in touch as Democrats with the administration as well. What I will say is this, get it right. We have to get it right. Whatever we decide to do, we have to get it right. And I agree with the President that once you act, you're committing American personnel, American resources in one way or the other. It doesn't mean simply boots on the ground. If you try to enforce a no-fly zone, there are men and women whose lives will be at stake. And so we have to get it right. I do believe the President is doing every American a great service in making sure that he gets it right. Because once we commit, we want to make sure that the full force of American power, whether it's soft or hard power, is used to get it right. And I hope the President weighs this very carefully because we've seen what happens, whether it's Iraq, uh, whether it was Vietnam, when we don't get it right. And we must get it right because the American people are tired of seeing us send our young men and women into battle without telling them what the end game will be or what, the, what we're doing to help not just Americans but the rest of the world. So I think the President has it absolutely correct, get it right. You know, that's, I would just say that that's something the President probably knows far better than any, any one of us, any me senator, any House member, or anyone else except perhaps some of the generals who advise, are advising him because he has as much information, all the latest intelligence before him. And I got to believe that what he's trying to do is make sure that when he tells the American people this is the course of action we're going to take, that he wants to be able to tell the American people he feels confident that he's getting it right. Well, I think the chairman has said it very well. It uh, doesn't really need to be expounded upon, uh, but I'll take the opportunity. Uh, uh, you know, the president, uh, we have had briefings uh, uh, as pertains to uh, the, the region uh, from uh, the uh, Secretary of State. Uh, and without going into the, some of the sensitive nature of, of those briefings, um, the provocations now uh, have been expanded with uh, uh, the, the uh, recent attacks by the State of Israel. And I've said before, I think Israel has the right, every right to defend itself uh, from potential threats. Uh, and I do, I do think that that does change uh, to some degree, uh, to fairly well, um, the, uh, the potential impact uh, as it pertains to her ally, the United States. Uh, but as uh, Chairman Becerra said, uh, the President 
uh, has able-bodied men and women around him, giving him all the information that he possibly uh, will need to make uh, the right move here. Donna, do you want to comment? I don't have anything to add. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. On immigration, you saw the, uh, the Heritage Report yesterday. I was wondering if you can comment on how you see that uh, affecting the debate, if, 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 if that really does have the potential to, to, to sink this thing right some you, you, you know, we, we could have expected some of this where uh, Republicans who less than a year ago were talking about self-deportation and vetoing the DREAM Act for young dreamers uh, would find it difficult to coalesce behind one particular approach on trying to reform a broken immigration system. Uh, but just as much as I heard about this heritage report, which I think is based on very faulty information, and will not drive this debate because it, it is so outlandish. Uh, I heard almost immediately that the Cato Institute uh, was completely on the opposite side. And so, as I said a few weeks ago, to some degree, I think Republicans are tying themselves up in knots uh, because I'm not sure they have yet settled on where they want to go. I do believe, though, that there is a growing and critical mass of Republicans in the House and the Senate who are joining Republicans throughout the country in saying, we just have to fix this broken immigration system. To do nothing is to let a broken immigration continue, but to do nothing would essentially be exactly what all these folks say they don't want, which is some form of amnesty uh, for a system that allows us not to understand who's in our country and who's working with the right or not, no right to work in this country. So uh, my sense is that you're seeing the percolation that occurs when an issue really does have an opportunity to become law. And what I hope is that Republicans will continue on this track of saying it's better to fix a broken immigration system than to just give up. I would just add, whatever happened to, the, to dynamic scoring? I mean, this is all the negatives, none of the positives in terms of what the, uh, uh, an immigration bill will bring uh, to the U.S. I think what it is is just a lot of information, negative information, just throw it out there and see what sticks. And that's all part of the game plan uh, by my, my Republican colleagues uh, to stop immigration reform. Um, the, the reality is it's irresponsible. Uh, is status quo working for anyone? Has anyone suggested the status quo is working? Uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans, I do believe there are some Republicans who want to see some movement here. I think there are Others who are, who are political minded, who, who, who recognize the need to do something for a political reason. But I think it goes beyond that. There's a moral issue here as well. The system is broken. Both the, uh, the, the, the legal immigrant uh, uh, system is a broken system. Uh, it's immoral to have a waiting list for a visa or for uh, a green card or for citizenship that exists in this country today. Uh, I don't think anyone has, has suggested so far. I'm not so sure the Heritage Foundation believes that the system that is, uh, that is in place today is working. And if it's not working, we need to fix it. Uh, I just think that, again, it's really more about taking as much gunk as you can, throwing it against the wall and seeing what sticks. Well, um, the fact is, I mean, we have, I think, the strongest alliance that we can think of between the business community, uh, between labor unions, and between those of us who know that in our communities all across this country, we have an immigration system that doesn't work and needs to be fixed. And I think that um, it's not surprising that those who don't want to see uh, more comprehensive immigration reform where we secure our borders and we make sure we know who's in this country and we give people a, a, a pathway, a legal pathway toward becoming uh, coming citizens would find, you know, some analysis that would support their wanting to defeat the, us moving forward. And I, I don't think it's going to work. I think the American people recognize that the system that we currently have doesn't work, that it needs to be fixed, and that this is about our own economic prospects and opportunities. And it's about growing our economy and protecting our borders. And I think that those forces are more strongly aligned and um, will take us over the hurdle of getting beyond the critique and beyond the, as uh, my colleague said, the make it stick factor. I don't think it's going to work.